Yeah, kind of. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, it's funny. Yeah. Uh, largely teaching, teaching at the Bowling Green. Okay. Uh, this semester. Uh, so you're instructor, part time, okay. just for a semester, what, a year. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Is that what's that? I, I don't want to. I don't want to. No, no, no. Talk go over here. Oh, no. Has that been working? Is there anything you said before now? Ice is too far apart. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, good evening, friends. Uh, we're the Beehive Design Collective, for those of you who have no idea who we are and why we have a big giant poster right here. Uh, before we get started, we really want to thank this space. We're really excited this place exists. I didn't really understand what we were coming into. This place is really rad, and we appreciate you having us tonight. And we want to let you know that we're not here to tell you how it is, and then you listen to us and consume information and then agree with us and think how right we are. We're here to have a conversation with you about something that we've, at, we've talked to a lot of people about. We're retelling stories that have been told to us. And it helps us to develop the way that we're going to present this for the future by seeing how you guys respond and what you're thinking. And we really wish we could pick your brains during the whole presentation. We're dying to know what you're thinking. So please let us know. <coughs> you don't have to raise your hand. Just interrupt us. If you agree, you want to high five, you want to maybe have a little bit more information, you want us to elaborate, just let us know. We're dying to know what you're thinking, okay? And, oh, I didn't introduce us. I'm Aaron. Hello. Hello, Aaron. Hello. This is Kevin. Hey. This is Tyler. Hello. And this is Acadia. Wow, they're so interactive already. I know, you guys are already <laughs> with us. <laughs> okay, and take it away, Kevin. I'm going to sit in this chair. So, thanks for coming to pay attention to us for a little minute. Um, so, we're the Beehive Collective, and um, we're a group of artists and activists and educators and all sorts of skills um, working together collaboratively for the past 10 years to um, make these tools um, that people use for organizing and education work. We say that our mission is to cross-pollinate the grassroots by making images that can be used to talk about scary, overwhelming, complex, often demobilizing things. and so. For us, this is about um, being on this big adventure of figuring out how to talk about what's going on in the world in a way that's super accessible for people and um, helps you find your place in the story. And so that's why we're way into like interacting with the audiences and um, learning as we go along. So everything that we're about to tell you is an evolution of us being sort of strapped to this big adventure for the past 10 years. And people of often get really curious of who we are and where we're based and how we're pulling this off and all that sort of behind the scenes, beehive, real life, the process, um, questions. And so I'm gonna go through and just give a brief introduction to the larger picture of what our group's work is. And please feel free to ask questions because it helps me be able to direct like, this big long story of what we're doing. And so, like I said, our group has been together for about 10 years now, and um, early on we decided we wanted to be um, place-based and do local community organizing as well as the larger activist work that we were running around traveling and doing. And so we bought this, this building here. This is the Machias Valley Grange Hall, and this is Bad Little Falls. It's a convergence of three waterfalls feeding into the Atlantic Ocean. And this is in the far corner of eastern Maine, like near the border of Canada, but also in the ocean. So we're way up in the corner. And we're, um, our community is a place that's been pretty fucked over economically for a long time. It's very familiar with resource extraction and is really excited about us being there because there's been a lot of youth flight and um, it's, it's really hard going in this part of the world. And so we found ourselves wanting to be useful to this place and by finding this building, we figured out a, a way to throw down a root and figure out this sort of mutualistic grafting of ourselves onto this community. So, um, so we bought this building um, 
called the, the Grange. Um, so does anybody know, have you ever heard of Grange Halls? Oh, yeah. Sure. All right, so what, what do we know about Grange Halls? It's a business for selling like grain and uh, merchandise for mm -hmm. farmers and uh, <coughs> commerce, I guess, mm -hmm. local level. Cool. Yeah, it's been a around a really long time. Um, the Granges were a really important, or are a really important piece of the political history, the union history of this country, and they were a really important piece of the rural fabric um, of the United States. There are these really special buildings that were in the center of lots of small towns all over the place, and they functioned as um, cultural centers and community centers for farmers and rural people to try to um, keep, com oh, sorry, I'm like eating dinner, oh. <laughs> All right, so, this, the Grange Halls were an outgrowth of the populist movement from the late 1800s, and it was farmers, rural people organizing to try to hold off the corporate monopolies of the day, the railroad barons, the big agricultural barons, and, um, and try to keep agriculture local. So there were craft co-ops, they had a lot of women and youth um, involved in the power structure of the organization. Some of them were involved in the Underground Railroad, and they had this beautiful history, which we knew a very smidgen amount about. But when we saw this building um, dilapidated and about to be ripped down, we fell in love with it. And then we found out that there were Grangers who were still meeting in this place and down the road for the past hundred years, and they were really excited <coughs> about us being able to work with them to restore this space. And so for the past long while, um, volunteers have been coming from all around the country, a lot of young activists, earth firsters, anarchists, um, people involved in the anti-globalization movement have been coming to Machias and jumping in and volunteering with all the different skills that it would take to restore this building. And how we've been paying for it is all with donations that we've been getting for the posters as we've been traveling around distributing them. And so at this point, we managed to get the building totally restored for its 100th birthday and had this huge um, reunion where the Grangers got to come back and start meeting in their building again. And we've been working away since then in restoring the life of the space as well and not just the husk of the building. And so we have all sorts of events. And in the summer, every August, um, we've been having this event called the Black Fly Ball, which is kind of undescribably magical so at this point. <coughs> it's about four or five hundred people show up every year and um, it's getting better every year and y'all are all invited which come sometimes like the third week in August. Do you have, and is that when the black soldier flies are meeting? It's actually in this black fly season oh, but right. yeah anyway yeah so black flies are around so yeah um so it's this really magical event where we have um, a radical marching bands come from elsewhere and then also our town has this ukulele club phenomenon where about 60 people playing ukulele all these cover songs from like the 70s and 80s and then we also um, have this ballroom dancing um, happening where the, the, the <coughs> band that plays out they were um, when they were young they were the house band of this Grange Hall so they're all like in their 70s and 80s at this point and they play the music that they've been playing in that space for a long time. So it brings out all different sorts of people, and it's kind of unbelievable seeing all these people hanging out and partying without alcohol and drugs in this, in this space at the same time. And so for that, it's like a really big treat for our county to have this event <coughs> happen, and a lot of people refer to it as the Mardi Gras of Eastern Maine. And so y'all should come and see it sometime. Because the highlight of it is us all going out to the waterfall and booty shaking torchlit next to this raging waterfall in the fog. And anyway, <laughs> so um, since 2005, um, we've been in this other space in town, and this is a, a different story that's a bit weirder. Where um, so we finished the Grange and we started trying to figure out how to like grow deeper roots in the community <coughs> and figuring out like how much support we had there. And this other building came up for sale called the Clark Perry House. And the history of this place is entirely different in that, um, ironically, it used to belong to the lumber baron of the whole county. So this is kind of the man's house, built with all the finest wood that we clear cut from the region. And it's built like a tank. And that's why we were really excited to have this space. It's not a fixer upper and be able to really um, hunker down and focus on our work more and have live work 
and studio space finally. And so since 2005, we've been sort of stretching out in this amazing space on two acres across town and figuring out how to put it to good use for the movement. Eventually, we want to have some kind of activist art residency where people can come and be housed to work on creative projects and have the space they need, good food, good conversation to make things collaborative, and then be able to plug their work into um, the distribution that we've been setting up for the Beehive over the years. And so um, we live and work in community um, collectively, and this is how we're pulling off not being <coughs> grant dependent. And none of us, like we're all volunteers, so when people are full time, they have their food and housing covered by the donations that we pull together from all these places around. And so people jump in and out in all different forms of volunteering to get this work done. And so, yeah, what else is there to say about that? Does anybody have any questions at this point? Because we're about to segue into talking to about a whole bunch of other things. It, just, it seems like you have forged this wonderful alliance. Like, if you think about, you know, if, if you, but to go into a small town, you would expect the kind of reception that you get, I mean, just in, in light of what they might perceive as your political bent. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 this type of thing, like you say, the, the critical words, I thought we would say, we are not relying on grant funding, not even government funding. And so you kind of like, you, you're, instead of being this polarizing force, you, you're actually, this, I, I, I'm fascinated by this sort of thing. And you can get the right and the left. I mean, to say it really bluntly, but I mean, you know, that, that I just, I'm amazed at that, that you're able to pull that off. I think that many of us could profit from looking at that kind of model when you're able to build a perfume. Well, I, I feel like there's a few um, sort of things that we really right or whatever that's worth mentioning about how we moved ourselves into this community was um, one thing is we didn't shoot our own horn. We were very um, shy for a long time. We didn't come in and say, here, here's what we do and we're here to save you and blah, blah, blah. We just like don't take ourselves that seriously. We were trying to figure out if we could fix this building up and so people really appreciated how humble that approach was and it wasn't until we actually finished the building that we really started coming out to the community and so um, we really won a lot of people over in that way. Also it's notable that um, certainly not everyone in this part of the world but the vast majority of people in in this area are, are white and so it's it's cuts this whole section of like tension out of the situation where we were really operating around thinking about class and trying to, to be on the, you know make allegiances and operate in a way that people in the working class people of this area would be excited about what we're doing and that this wasn't a project that was for people from away and like the summer people because there's a there's a huge class division in our community and so really I think one of the the, the biggest achievements of of, of um, restoring this space is that usually when a building gets macked out to the nines, as we have done here, it, as a cultural center, it then gets taken away from the community and it becomes this like $20 a seat for some theater tickets or whatever kind of thing and that we have totally not done that. The building is paid off and we get to have all of the <coughs> events for free and so everything's all ages, drug and alcohol free and, and free. And so for us to be able to have this space yeah. that's so fucking gorgeous for the people whose building it is feels like a huge deal. And people are still kind of like, whoa, really? <laughs> like we don't have to pay for it? That's fucking awesome, yeah. right? Yeah. So the other thing is that we didn't, at trying to create a social center, we didn't pick a random, a random rental sort of situation. Um, we picked a building that already had this beautiful history Right, so this building is like on this sketchy corner and you have to drive it around really slow. And for years people were watching it fall apart and it's so it kind of became this like wishing well where people would drive around <coughs> thing and be like, oh man, why does stuff like that have to fall apart, you know? Like people would leave their heart on this building of like, God, I wish that would come back to life. So we got the treat of being the angels that dropped out of nowhere to like restore this thing that already had this rich <coughs> history, right? So it's not like some random space that we're doing good, like trying to be do-gooders in and then trying to convince people to come over, even though it's like intimidating and people see it as like our space. 
this is very much a piece of the community that's come back to life. And so in that way, we're seen as kind of stewards of the space and not as owners of the space. And so that was like a, a really um, pivotal decision that we made. So yeah. I could go on and on, <laughs> but so um, we'll just move on to other stuff <coughs> about what we're doing before we jump into talking about the poll poster. <laughs> so, a little known thing about the Beehive is that we actually started as a stone mosaic mural cooperative. Um, we took on these big mural projects and then ended up meeting apprentices and wanted to teach people. And so, in the beginning, eight women showed up who had all met each other at a, a big protest in D.C. about the IMF. And we started finishing this big mural project together and working on other mosaics and taking on apprentices. And so this is the traditional kind of stone mosaic that's a, a really um, like a lost art, that it's all marble and granite that's very tediously cut bit by bit by hand and um, laid out to describe really richly the fur and feathers and things on the creature. <coughs> and we never thought we would find any more anything more labor intensive and neurotic to do than mosaic until the posters came along. Um, and this was very the the formation of the collective was very much um, activists who were trying to figure out some way to feed their fidgety, some kind of art therapy for us to do that we could work our shit out and be able to be useful to the big world. So we weren't really coming at it as artists who were adding activism in as our subject matter, but rather activists <coughs> who were trying to figure out how to use visual things to talk about our concerns, right? So, and, and find other visual learners and engage people on that level of stuff. So it may seem really random and like all over the place, what I'm talking about here of like mosaics and this town and graphics and there's a lot of things going on. But there's really a theme that goes through everything that we do. And all SBs are geeked out about being able to think about and hold in our minds the macrocosm and the microcosm simultaneously and think about the play between those things. So like the big picture and the little picture and being able to exercise both parts of our minds in that way. Because a lot of us in the group um, grew up in this culture on video games and junk food and television and we have the attention span of a flea. So for us, this is like exercising that our attention span and trying to figure out ways to, to not just um, work on ourselves individually, but be useful to the larger picture, right? So mosaic, by the way, this is somebody's first mosaic. This was like an apprentice work and it's all scrap from behind countertop places. And um, so the mosaic obviously is a is an example of like all the little pieces and moving around to make the big picture. And then biodiversity obviously is like all the little details, right, that like add up to the larger ecosystem. We totally geek on thinking how all that stuff's connected and um, intermingled. And then in the beginning, the original intention with the posters was to try to make these visual maps where people could we could like lay out where all the single issues how they interconnect because our group very much formed alongside the upsurge of the anti-globalization movement post um protests in seattle around the wto 10 years ago um, we really wanted to be useful to helping people think about this super overwhelming stuff about globalization environmental destruction climate change all of these things as in a way where you could see yourself in the little picture and then draw it drawed out from there as a map of where you fit. So alongside um, figuring out how to pull this stuff off and form ourselves as a group and um, get our needs met, our basic needs met, we've also been figuring out how to evolve this methodology um, that sprouted up out of making these posters. And so um, we've been figuring out um, how to achieve our goals of making uh, art that's respectful of its audience, that's cross-cultural, that is um, a tool that can be used across borders for people to describe what's going on. And so um, in that way, we've been pushing ourselves with each project to try to make the, um, the genesis of all the ideas come as directly from the source 
that it, as possible. So to do that, <coughs> we've been talking to all sorts of people and trying to get the story straight. So this is a, a picture of us um, talking at a young teacher's training school in Honduras and um, collecting a lot of stories from kids there that we would use as context for the poster. <laughs> and then um, when we started working on the poster about coal that we're going to get into tonight, um, we again wanted to go to the people who were most affected um, by the issues and get their story first and be accountable to those people. So we were taking our graphics around uh, Appalachia, talking to all sorts of people, trying to gather those stories. And this is how we sort of take notes, because people are saying all sorts of random, random stuff to us, and we have to like figure out how it's all interconnected, right? So you can imagine that this is sort of the skeleton behind each <coughs> one of the graphics, where it's this um, bubble map, we call them mind maps, of how all these different issues interconnect. And so we have big conversations um, al alongside people while we're gathering the information, but then with each other, about how to lay all this stuff out on one piece of paper. And so once we figure out all the concepts and what we're gonna try to pull off um, with the scope of the graphic, then each one of these things becomes a metaphor and we do lots of metaphor push-ups together that take sometimes um, months or years in the case of some of our latest posters. And, and then we pick uh, appropriate characters to play out those metaphors and look up the right species and all these things to get it all straight. And so once we figure out that stuff, then we get to the challenge of trying to fit it all on one piece of paper. Because it's like a comic book, but you're seeing all of it at once. And so to do that, we have to choreograph all these little tiny pieces of tracing paper and lots of different sketches that we're all pulling off together. And once we get done with all the pencil work and the line work, then we set to doing the whole thing in pen and ink. And this is another last art because it's very tedious and time consuming to be drawing all of this stuff only in black and white and lines and dots. And a lot of people ask us how um, the images come together so cohesively as an aesthetic. Like, it looks like one person did it, but it's obviously way more people than that. It's because that, that medium is super rigid and that it is all just lines and dots in black and white. And also because the, our collaboration process is lots of different skills all over like layered up on top of each other. So some people work on the plant, some people work on the robots, some people just help with the perspective and the math, some people are just a random snail species geek in Nova Scotia that we call randomly um, in the middle of the night when we have a question. Um, there's all sorts of things that all come together to make the posters happen. And so this is a little bit of um, the, the timeline <laughs> of the posters and the evolution. The first two, um, actually they came out in 2000, um, were about biotechnology. And so the first one was this critique of genetically engineered corns of negative effects on the caterpillars of the monarch butterflies. And this was an event poster for um, a, an event that was happening in Boston at the time, right after um, the big protest in Seattle later that spring. And the other biotech one was sort of zooming out to talk about the homogenization of our culture and monoculture and how that's affecting all these different aspects of our lives. And this is the last time that you'll see us draw a human um, and use words. And we're going to get into that more in a minute. But So then we started working on a trilogy about globalization in the Americas. And this is when we started to play more with animal metaphors and talking about hard, overwhelming truths in terms of fables and um, like really incorporating more images of the natural world into what we were doing and dropping out the humans and the words as much as possible. So can anybody guess? There's a whole bunch of an answers to this and it gets really woo if you wanted to. Um, why you wouldn't want to draw pictures of humans? Like why did we just segue away from that? Can anybody guess? It would be potentially controversial depending on how they're depicted. For sure. Yeah. What else? That's where the eye would focus. What? That's where the eye would focus. That's where the eye would focus. Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking that you put a picture of an individual human being in there as opposed to the corporation or the oligarchy. So you use the symbolism to uh, depict the power structures. 
and not the individual. Right. For real. Yep. What else? Hey, you can sit on me. Oh, come on, y'all. <coughs> so, another thing is like maybe human beings are pretty narcissistic in the way that we just see the world through the lens of humans all the time, right? And so this is sort of an ambush to like get us to get over ourselves for a second here and not just think of things in terms of humans and that one's me and that's everybody else and here's what the humans are doing to each other and like get lost in that kind of stuff. Like this brings in the whole other element of talking about for sure like the power structures, the symbols, the, the, the systematic things that are happening as well as all the level of, of ecosystem disruption that's happening. And so, um, yeah, this is when we started getting into playing with that and of course leaving out the words as much as possible because we were figuring out that we were making this tool that could function across boundaries of language and learning. Um, a lot of people were excited about coloring the posters and there were all ages of people um, using them in different ways. And so the next round of um, going at it with the graphic we decided to make this poster about um, Plan Colombia. So talking about um, U.S. foreign policy, how it plays out in South America in terms of the drug <coughs> war, and being able to talk about um, globalization through the lens of like a specific place in the Western Hemisphere and sort of zoom out from there. And so we talk about colonization all the way into like specific details of how colonization and um, capitalism have affected people's individual lives. And since 2002, people all over the place have been using this poster to tell the story of what's going on, maybe where they are, through the lens of talking about Plan Colombia. And so to make that poster, we started um, our, our new adventure of trying to get the story straight by, um, to make that one, a few of us went to Ecuador and Colombia and made that poster with people there so everything in it is for all, all request or edit of people we spoke with from the region about how to tell that story. And so that's when we started figuring out that that's really what we needed to do to get this stuff right and to get the, to be most responsible to the people whose story it is. And so since then, we've been working on the third poster that we call Mesoamerica Resiste. It's about something called Plan Puebla Panama, which is this mega development project that literally seeks to pave the way for globalization and resource extraction throughout Central America and Southern Mexico. And when a team of 10 of us went for five months all throughout this region collecting stories and figuring out how to tell the story, many people we spoke with say that they consider um, the PPP, Plan Puebla Panama, to be a cultural and ecological death sentence for this place in the world that's been in the way for the past 500 years of trade. And so, we were also on this adventure of trying to figure out how to not just tell the bad news and to try to tell the good news as much or twice as much. And so um, how this poster works is it folds out. And by the way, we've been working on this for five years now. It's sort of the, the mega project for the collective and there, we've been inking it for the past two years. Um, so um, the poster on the outside, it's all gonna look like an old map and be this kind of trick where you see um, symbols of 500 years ago as well as what's going on today all in this old map style and then you open the poster and the inside is twice as big and it's all a scene at the base of a, a seba tree the mayan tree of life um, that <coughs> is all in the rainforest and there's 400 um, <coughs> species of animals in this poster and they're all being drawn specifically from photograph, um, every ant is different this time around, and the reason that we're trying to do that is so that we can make a map of how um, the ecology and the economics, which often get talked about separately, of this region can all be seen simultaneously, and people can talk about how those things are connected. So this is the drawing table. Um, there's a few of us at this point. Um, people have been dropping like flies from the project, and there's a few of us um, working away trying to fill in this mural sized thing with little tiny dots and lines and hopefully we'll get it done this year. Wish us luck. Try not to go crazy. <coughs> so any questions at this point? Cool. Alright, so um, we've also 
been figuring figuring out how to uh, tell stories with these things and how they get used. Because once we started drawing really complicated posters, then all of a sudden we're trying to explain what's going on in them, and then the next thing you know, we're telling an audience what's going on, and the next thing you know, the audience is telling us, and it kept growing and being the snowball of all this information. And so we've been figuring out how to hone our different um, sort of teaching methods for using the posters. And so there's all different ways that the banners are out in the world being used. Um, we take them to high schools, and um, a lot of teachers are using them in their classrooms with different sorts of um, projects for kids to dissect them and learn about the different pieces in the posters. We go to the country, like the Common Ground Fair in Maine, is a big country fair, and have all the banners on display. We have a huge amount of support <coughs> statewide in Maine for what we're doing. Um, there's a lot of old hippies up there that are super cheering us on because you know collectives don't work, right? So we're but we're like 10 years old at this point, so people are like rooting us on. And <coughs> we also go to the School of the Americas protest in Fort Benning, Georgia, that happens every year, and that's an example of us being like super out there with a con at a connection point with thousands of people from all over the place who can take the posters and spread them like seeds. And so in that way. We've been able to distribute over 70,000 posters by hand over the years and get to be very connected with our audience and get to evolve um, alongside the posters by way of what people think about them and what they think we should do next and all that stuff. So we'll be outside screaming at the top of our lungs or we might be inside at different classrooms and this is uh, the backbone of our fundraising <coughs> comes from student groups bringing us to their college and um, helping make donations that way. Okay, so um, one of the bees um, has been on this big adventure for the past two years, running around Colombia and Ecuador and, and Venezuela, getting the, the as many po as possible Colombia posters back to the people whose story it is. And he's been involving all these different workshops, mostly talking to Afro-Colombian and indigenous pop, uh, communities all throughout the region, having them see their story within the graphic and sort of decode the thing getting kids to focus on particular stories in the graphic and then getting them to draw their own version and then teaching them how to silk screen. He was working with a lot of street kids and then make their own cute little fashion. I'll come on. That is Aww. so cute. Come on, guys. Aww. Aww. All right. Aww. Aww. <laughs> I want one. Um, I want one too. <laughs> so, so that's it. That's, that's uh, the story of our evolution of our group. But we're about to segue into talking about um, this graphic in particular. So if anybody wants to ask about process or um, the sort of beehive real world things that you might be curious about, um, you can do it now or you can jump in later. We're going to make you talk more at this point. I'm just going to throw a bunch of stuff at you. <coughs> Um, so, we also do a lot of um, smaller graphics commission works uh, that folks can, that are made specifically for folks to use on their pamphlets and flyers and things like that. Um, we made this one for our friends uh, in the group Rising Tide and called the Caracade. It's to remind us that burning more fossil fuels means more carbon in the atmosphere, means more climate chaos, right? Um, and Recently, we decided to focus specifically on issues around climate change because, um, you know, talk about a big picture issue. That's talk about it to everything. Not right? a real focus. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, th there over the years, there have been a lot of requests to do a poster about mountaintop removal. And in spring of 2008, 10 bees traveled down to the southern Appalachian coal field region. Uh, the, the area where mountaintop removal is happening is primarily West Virginia, Kentucky, and East Tennessee. Folks spent two months traveling through there, talking with all sorts of different folks. This is the short list of um, really great collaborating groups that helped us to understand the issues, helped connect us with folks um, who could give us more information, share stories with us, uh, hosted us throughout our time there. Um, hold on. Sorry. And, uh, and actually, even beyond that, 
um, we've been staying in touch with these folks and we're working on a print run collaboration. So when we're finally ready to go to print, we're going to get 10,000 posters printed. Um, and, and, and folks are really interested in um, pitching in a little bit of money to buy a big stack of posters at just above cost to help us get the initial funds to, 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 to get those 10,000 printed. And then we'll send them off to them. And right away, as soon as they're hot off the presses, all these different folks will be distributing them all over through their networks. And we're really excited about that. Um, so we, um, you know, uh, we talked with folks like um, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, this really great uh, uh, land rights um, group that's been doing a lot to fight mountain top removal in Kentucky. And we talked with Coal River Mountain Watch, folks that have been in the news a lot lately with Climate Ground Zero. They've been doing a lot of direct action to slow down um, the mining in, uh, in the Coal River area. And uh, we went to see the mine sites themselves. And while we were on the trip, we started doing sketches already uh, to show to folks, make sure we were, go were going in the right direction. And, and we brought all of these sketches and all of these stories back to our studios in Maine. And we spent hours and days and weeks and months arguing over them. Collaborating. Also known as collaborating. <laughs> yeah. um, Which we have really weird arguments, so you're welcome to imagine at any point where we're talking about something kind of bizarre in the poster, <laughs> like the very bizarre conversation that we had to come up with that. Like, for example, what, what decade does this federal soldier hat on this bull come from it to be uh, appropriate, right? <laughs> um, we w it we, takes a lot we of searched mind, through it. dozens and dozens of photos <laughs> <laughs> to get it right. Anyway, so then we um, continued to draw more and more sketches, con continuously refining the thing. And we, we printed up this work in progress banner um, to take to take back to the folks who had given us the stories to make sure we got them right, and to take to folks who uh, may have never even heard of mountaintop removal to make sure that the things, the stories we were trying to tell made sense and were legible. And we got collected lots of feedback and kept doing more drafts, and this is the third rough draft version right here. <coughs> That's why it's hard to look at right now. You can't really see what's going on because this is still like sketchy and the line work, and it doesn't have all the ink on it yet. Yeah. So. The way this works, it also has a folding mechanism. Um, are you all familiar with Mad Magazine? Does that fold in on the back, right? Um, you know, you get two pictures out of one. So when this, fold, when this poster starts, folded up, it shows an intact mountain valley with clean streams running through it and lots of native critters kind of hanging out. And it, when it's opened up, this huge mine site in the middle you see, um, you see very dynamically how that mine site tears the mar mountain apart. And just, a, just a, a little, quick little explanation to help you understand as we go through it. Um, all the all the characters and stories and scenes in the foreground are the <coughs> effects that are happening in Appalachia. There are direct translations of stories on that people on the ground told us about. And up near the top, there are these bigger picture things. Um, Sort of the power analysis. These are uh, looking at where the coal is, where the coal is going, and um, uh, globalization and things like that. And it also is divided up into a series, roughly divided up into a series of five chapters that go chronologically. Um, the first chapter on the far left is about the stories of the land. It's about the formation of the mountains, formation of the coal, uh, stories about the people who lived there before industrial scale coal mining. And chapter two is about colonization and the industrial revolution and all of the huge changes that happened as a result. The big double wide chapter three, this huge section in the middle, is all about mountaintop removal and oh, sorry. is all about mountaintop removal, how it works, why it's happening, where the coal is going, what kind of effects it's, <coughs> it's having. And chapter four is all about different ways that people are resisting, um, trying to get uh, mountaintop removal slow down and abolish. Chapter five is um, is is a very forward-looking uh, chapter about ways that people are uh, are working to regenerate, to build alternatives, to um, to 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 heal and clean the soil and the water, and uh, and to rebuild and strengthen their communities. 
And so we've been trying all sorts of different ways of telling this story. Um, on this tour, we're trying something uh, a little bit different. We're starting in the middle, focusing on mountaintop removal, because we've been talking a lot with folks who aren't very familiar with it. So we're going to go through all the basics on what that is first, and then we're slowly going to work our way outward, um, bringing in historical context and these bigger picture things to broaden the scope as we go. Now it's my turn. Yeah. Yay, good job, Tyler. <laughs> So, hello everyone. Hello. Um, before we get into it, we're going to give you a quick rundown of exactly how all this works. Who knows about mountaintop removal? Good chunk of people. Okay, cool. I didn't know about it until I joined this um, project, so don't feel bad if you don't know about it. Who knows someone who's worked on a campaign or knows someone who's been directly affected by mountaintop removal? Okay, cool. Well, I'm just going to get a real quick run through so those who don't know know what's going on. All right, first we have to understand why the Appalachian Coalfields region is so important. The Appalachian Mountains are some of the most biodiverse ecosystems, ecosystem, is one of the most biodiverse ecosystems in the world. And the mountains themselves are the oldest mountains in the world. So here's, what, here's the story. A long time ago, when the glaciers were still covering the United States, the ice was sometimes up to a mile thick, and the tops of these mountains stuck out the top and didn't get covered. It was like little islands of land in an ocean of ice. And all the life forms that were left on top of these mountains were left to develop individually by themselves, isolated on the mountaintops. So many of the mountains have their own species of salamander, many of the streams have their own species of mussel, and just like the animals are diverse, so are the plants. When the glaciers went away, all the land that they had covered was completely barren and devoid of plant life. So the seeds from these trees spread out over millions of years, covering what we now know as the mixed Mesophytic forests, like the, the temperate forests, all the way from the Rocky Mountains to the, to the Atlantic Ocean. Trees that we all know and love. Elms, oaks, pines. Call them out, anybody. Up Chestnut. Maple. <coughs> and Sycamore. Sycamore. This tree girl over here knows what she's talking about. So what that means is that all of this plant life is derived from the top of these mountains and that also means that the old growth on top of these mountains is much more ancient than the rest of the forests in, this, in southeastern United States. And they're incredibly genetically diverse because of all the time they spent evolving. Also, the Appalachian Mountains are the headwaters for the drinking water for a huge majority of southeastern United States. The water that comes from these mountains goes down through the, to the Mississippi, feeds down to New Orleans, Atlanta, Washington, D.C. Tons of people drink the water that comes from this place. So what is coal? Oh my gosh, I conveniently have a piece that you guys can look at while I'm talking about it. It's not nearly as heavy as it looks. I'm not going to give it to you because you know what it feels like. Here you go. Pass it around. Um, please return it to us when you're done. <coughs> Thank you. So uh, you might be able to tell that this is my favorite part of the presentation because I geek out really hard about it. 400 million years ago it was the Carboniferous period. The Earth was hotter because there was more carbon in the atmosphere, which meant there was less ice, which meant there was more water all over the planet. And much of what we now know to be dry land was covered in brackish swamps and shallow, and shallow seas. So the coal fields region in particular had these plants that grew and they grew taller than trees. And the modern day versions of these plants are club moss, ferns, and horsetails. And those plants do now what they did back then, which is they sucked toxins out of the water and carbon out of the atmosphere. These ancient plants jump-started the atmosphere into turning into somewhere where organisms like us could live. So I really enjoy these plants. Feel free to snort at any point. <laughs> <laughs> and so the bacteria that exists today to decompose these plants didn't, hadn't evolved yet. It wasn't real. So instead of decomposing, these plants just fell over and piled up on top of each other. Then over thousands of years, the silt in the oceans and the currents would change and deposit silt on top of the plants. And they'd grow again and it would go plant silt, plant silt, plant silt, and it would super compress over millions of years to form, who's got the coal? To form wherever the coal went. To form that coal over there! That right there, you're holding millions of years of sunlight energy, super ancient plants compressed. And now, just like then, those cells that make up that coal do the same thing they used to do, which is they, 
they suck out toxins. That's why if you run water through coal, it comes out clean. So the Appalachian region, the springs that bubble forth out of here, are some, is some of the cleanest drinking water in the world. It's like the Earth's delicious Brita filter, right? So when it's in the ground, coal does all these amazing things. But when you take it out of the ground and you burn it and you break it, and you mess about with it, it releases all of those toxins that it's been sucking up. And that is why coal is the dirtiest burning fossil fuel. Whew, that was a mouthful. So, mountaintop removal. This is our best picture to go with the metaphor of how we like to explain it to those who don't know. Imagine that this is your birthday cake, right? Here's the bedrock. These lines right here are the coal seams. And the bedrock is the cake, and the coal seams are the icing. And what the coal companies are doing is knocking off the cake and licking up the icing. I forgot to mention before I get to the slide, but they uh, before they blow up the mountain, they clear cut all the trees and they push all the topsoil off. This is important to remember because sometimes they don't, well, a majority of the time, they don't even do anything with these trees they cut down. They just throw them into the haulers and let them sit because it would actually take more time and more money for them to set up selling them and using this lumber. And then they blow up the mountain. They use millions of pounds of explosives every day. Then they use what's called a drag line to drag all over the mountain. This looks like a crane, but it is not a crane. These, some of the largest ones can get up to 20 stories tall, and the buckets on the largest can hold up to three Greyhound buses. Then they use these giant drag lines and they scrape all the bedrock that they blew up and dump it into the valleys, into the haulers. For perspective, uh, this is a road. This is a big road. And these little dots here are trees. So what once was, you know, up and down mountain ridges is now all one flat land. It's hard to look at, especially for me, it's hard to look at this and understand exactly what's going on here. But entire mountain ridges have been destroyed. 470 named mountains no longer exist. Many of these mountain top removal sites can be seen from space. This picture is the one that, at least for me personally, to share with you, this is when I first understood what was going on because, you know, my brain just couldn't really process these pictures. They looked so alienating. It was like looking at the moon. You couldn't, I couldn't understand it, but this <coughs> photo was taken from really high up. This is an aerial, sh aerial view photo, and the mountain top removal site goes almost all the way to the horizon. We're, we're talking miles. That's, that's very big. So talk about a problem, like an issue, that's going to make you feel small. Like, that's about as alienating and demobilizing as it gets. Looking at these pictures and being like, oh yeah, I'm going to stop that, right? You know? So that's one of the reasons that this was one of the most requested um, images for, from people for us to do, because um, Folks in this region who have been trying to stop mountaintop removal and strip mining for a while have been um, eager to have some kind of tool, visual tool, to talk about what's going on here in a way that isn't, doesn't just make people shut down when they see a picture of it. And so we have this trick to be able to talk about the big picture and then also show the human scale and the ecological scale all on the same, all on the same page. And so that's why a lot of people requested it and are super excited to put this thing to work to talk about this issue as soon as it hatches. So in the middle of the poster, in the dead center, we, just, we show the drag line. And on a lot of our posters, we draw these big, I'm sure you can see all around the room, we draw these big, scary, like, monster machines. They look really, like, uh, sort of demonic sometimes. But we actually felt that this machine was scary enough as is, and we just drew it exactly the way it was. And you can see it blowing up the side of the mountain where there's a graveyard and scraping up a mining community. And we do this, firstly, to show that they're I don't mention this often, but I, I wanted to say it, that um, a l there's been many instances in the, the regions that we're talking about of mining companies blowing up, <coughs> and remember I told you they scrape the topsoil, of scraping up graveyards <coughs> and scraping up people's like family graveyards and just dumping the caskets over the side of the mountain and the haulers. And this is just to illustrate with what little regard these companies have for the history and, and the people who live here. We also show a picture of erosion. Remember I told you the trees and the topsoil? I think you, Katie. Yeah, the trees and the topsoil are, are 
one of the first things to go before they even start blowing up the mountain. Those are the really the only things that keep rainwater from gushing into these valleys and, and creating flash floods. We also show this this sort of generic pipe uh, sending out like toxic toxic water to to illustrate the toxification of, of the water that's happening in uh, Appalachia. I mean, the, the toxins that are being released from the coal are getting to a point where they're seeping into the aquifers and getting into people's drinking water. So we show black water coming from the tap. You can see it's kind of hard to see. It's a little tadpole getting black water. The, the, the aquifers that are changed that are also, affect, also excuse me, <coughs> affecting the plants that are growing. So this gardener's uh, harvest is all blighted, and she's got a scar from her gallbladder removal surgery because there have been the incidence of gallbladder and kidney issues has skyrocketed in, in these areas. And then we move on to the sludge dam. Can you click the sludge dam here? There we go. So what coal companies are required to do by the Clean Air Act is to clean the coal of the dirtiest parts of it, the most toxic parts of it, so that there's less sulfur that gets burned, so there's less acid rain in the air. But what do they do to clean it? Well, they just literally wash it with, um, with water, with water and cleaning chemicals. And then the toxic water that's left over of all the stuff they cleaned off of the coal is just put in a dam. Uh, these dams are earthen dams. They're made out of the mountains they just blew up. And they're some of the largest earthen dams in the world. And the trees and the topsoil that I told you about is all sitting at the bottom of this. That are, and they're decomposing and they're moving about, which doesn't necessarily uh, establish them safe <coughs> to the dams. So this is a sludge dam. <coughs> this is uh, the coal refinery company. This is the road they take to get there. Uh, there's a mountaintop removal site over here and over here that's blasting daily, shaking the ground. And, um, and this is Marsh Fork Elementary School. At Marsh Fork, um, many of the teachers have cancer, many of the children have asthma, and there is a bus driver in a bus in the parking lot all, all day long during school hours prepared to evacuate if the dam were ever to break. And if it were to break, they would have three minutes to get out. And it's one question that people ask us sometimes when they say, when they see this, they say, why did they build a school there? Well, the school is there first. And so dead center, near the bottom of the poster, we show a flood. This is to illustrate, and, and these two rats who are in the flood, to illustrate this new presence of, of, of floods in these people's lives. Flash floods due to erosion, as well as toxification of their water, and the very real threat of spills. Before I continue, has anybody heard of what happened in Harriman, Tennessee last year? Would anybody like to explain it to me at all? Could you give us some background? Just that, uh, from, from what I understand, the uh, the, uh, the dam gave <coughs> way, uh, mm -hmm. and and basically uh, there was so much sludge uh, that took out people's houses and trailers for for miles around, and has have uh, really, um, I mean, polluted the water even more and yes. devastated the people that lived in the area. Yes, thank you. That's, that's a lot of it. And there's some other stuff that I didn't even notice until recently, but <coughs> it was 100 times larger than the Exxon Valdez spill. It was the, it is the largest pollution related disaster that's happened in American history. For years, well, I, I take you back a second. What spilled was fly ash. Does anyone know what fly ash is? I will tell you. Fly ash is all of the stuff left after burning the coal. The ash that has all of the heaviest metals that don't burn off. Uh, mercury. Arsenic. Uranium. uranium. Arsenic. Selenium. Yeah. Terrible things. <coughs> and to keep the ash from flying away, they just put it in these ponds full of water. And they just build these levees around these ponds and let it sit. And for years, these levees in Harriman, Tennessee had been leaking. But the Tennessee Valley Authority didn't do anything about it. And a couple days before Christmas last year, they broke. And like you said, many people's homes were destroyed. Luckily, it was a rural area, so not too many people were affected. But um, two rivers that are draining currently to the Mississippi were completely polluted. And the TVA is not doing anything about it other than covering it up. It's not surprising how many of you haven't heard about it because they're doing a really good job. There wasn't a news story about it for up to at least three days after. And even then, it was just a, a blip. You didn't 
Oh, I didn't explain the picture. This is the most important part. All right. This looks like a beach, but this is not a beach. These these rockish looking items are, are the sludge, and this is the water they lived in. This right here is what Tennessee is supposed to look like. This is someone's house. So they blow up the mountain, they take all the coal, they make a bunch of toxic sludge and put it everywhere, and then what are they supposed to do when they are done taking all they can? They are required by law to restore the mountain to its approximate original contour. This legally speaking, means about half as tall as it used to be. So they take all the rocks that they blew up and they sort of pat it into a mountain shape. And then of course, to reclaim it and make it as good as it used to be, they must make it green again. So they spray it with this stuff called hydro seed. Hydro seed, from what we understand and what we've been told, will make grass grow on your car. This is, yeah, in our opinion, this is hardly replacement for millions of years of forest. Oh, there we go. Now, what the coal companies are saying about all of this reclaimed land is, well, it's really great because you guys had a shortage of flat land. And now we have tons of flat land conveniently available for you to have new Walmarts installed, which are pushing out small businesses. They also have lots of room for new private prisons where all these old coal miners who now need jobs can be security guards. We show the prison is also knocking a school off of the mountaintop removal site. This is to talk about Marsh Fork, but it's also to talk about what's going on to encourage people to leave because it is easier for the coal companies to do what they do when there's less people who live there and less people to speak out. So in many of the counties in West Virginia, there's only one high school left. So, like we said, we're moving in this fire. We want to take a step back and look at history a little bit and see how all of this stuff got established, how mountaintop removal began, and look at the history of coal mining. Started, one of the major things in the very beginning was the broad form deed. The broad form deed was it established that people had surface rights and mineral rights. Surface rights mean that you own everything from here up. And if someone once upon a time came along and bought your mineral rights, even though you didn't ever think that <coughs> mining would be more than just digging underground, uh, they paid a lot of these people like 25 cents per acre. And mineral, mineral rights trumps surface rights. So if a coal company comes along and says, we have the mineral, mineral rights to your land and we're going to do mountaintop removal, get out. So in Kentucky, folks were still battling against the broad form deed up until the 1980s. That's how Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, who we mentioned before, that was their first major victory, was finally defeating that and uh, stopping this practice of kicking people out and taking their land for strip mining. So we show right here a picture of a coal mining town. Does anybody know how these work that would like to tell me about? No, that's cool. So I don't know if this is easier to see here or here, but I'm gonna point over here. So. Here we've got the boss's house, and it's really nice looking, and attached to it is the company store and the church, which were both also owned by the boss. And uh, attached to the boss's house with these dollar sign chains are the homes that the miners themselves lived in. Now miners, a lot of times, were paid in this thing called company script. Not even US dollars. Company script was only available to be sold at the company store, which meant the company store could charge whatever they wanted. Now the miners had to pay rent, so they, they got paid this company script, and in script they had to pay back their rent for their clothes, for their tools, for their food, for everything that they had until it got to a point where a lot of times, no matter how hard you worked, at the end of the week you were more and more in debt. Oh. Much like how private prisons are working. Yeah. I read a book by a guy named Irving Stone, uh -huh. and he was writing about Clarence Darrow. It's called, I think it's for the defense. Mm -hmm. but it was like a history lesson. It's talking about Clarence Darrow, one of the greatest lawyers. He really was like an anarchist, but he was a lawyer. Uh, he defended. <laughs> he, well, yeah, he defended um, <coughs> union workers, and you know they're not the same as they was then, and uh, people that were called communists and different things. But what you describe in there is what I read in the book, that they had brought in a lot of immigrants mm. from different yes. countries over here to the South. 
and they had them working, but they had them fenced in, and they could only go to the company store. And it was like they were in a form of slavery. This is after slavery. Yeah. But these were white Europeans, they were Irish. Uh, wage slave. Right, wage slave, wage Polish slave. people. that They had in concentration camps in this country, in the South, right after slavery. Mm -hmm. And they were using black people, uh, were doing um, what they call sharecropping. Mm -hmm. But they, they shipped in these people from Europe. And um, they was doing the same thing in uh, George Pullman yeah. with the railroads. He was doing the same thing. Yeah. Had the people working. People was getting killed doing his job. The families was getting nothing. <laughs> if the wage earner died, then the fa family was kicked out and the family mm -hmm. was still in debt to the company. And this was going on all across the country. Exactly. Not just there the way it's described, but I never knew that. Yeah. But it was described in those terms like this is a, it's kind of a slavery that was going on that you know most people we we don't know our history we don't read like a lot of black people say well we only people in slavery in this country but if you really read it's a lot of things Americans don't know about their own history mm -hmm. and a lot of that's why people so easily vote against their best interests when they get involved in politics when people say it's states rights to do this you just got finished talking about mm -hmm. state right of that what mm -hmm. Kentucky yeah. yeah and they probably was hollering that when they was arguing against people having their right yeah. On their own land. Well, it's the state's right to do this, you know. But a lot of people argue against their own history because they don't even know their history. Yeah. You Thank know? you very much. Yeah. That's yeah. Actually, I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah. Another yeah. thing is that you can tell the story about the 37. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So another thing that we talking about, what you talk about, is we went yeah. to a museum of uh, a coal mining museum and we saw a sign, a mm -hmm. danger, like danger sign that went in front of the, the entrance to the mine in 37 different languages. Yeah. They would bring people in that couldn't talk to each other, which made it harder for them to mobilize, which made it harder for unions to form, which is exactly <coughs> a lot of what we talked about. Right. Thank you very much for sharing. And, okay, cool. So, can you go back, actually? This is what he's talking about, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. I just wanted to mention one thing from the previous slide real quick. Also, I just wanted to point out that we've got this train pulling coal away from the mining towns. A lot of the coal that was mined here wasn't even for the people who lived in the local area. It was shipped away, which is something that's still happening today. Next. Another thing, talking about what you're talking about, we, we also reference uh, leasing <coughs> convicts, convict labor. Yeah. This ant in particular might look familiar. Um, he's a representation of John Henry. Yeah. Which you may yeah. remember, a very famous yeah. African American. With, um, the beat the train was trying to beat the train. Yeah, he was yeah. trying to beat the machine. Yeah. You can yeah. see he's beefier than the other ants that are yeah. in the poster. Um, also, we talk about. He has the most songs. Oh yeah, he has the most songs written about him. And yeah. Okay. Sorry, boo. He has the most songs written about him than anybody else in American history, which is pretty fantastic. And we show to further talk about uh, convict leasing. We have this this canary with a uh, a black bird in a cage. Now canaries. There's stories about canaries in the coal mine. Like, what's that? What's the deal with that? So oxygen levels that that when the canary would die, <laughs> it was either too late or it's time to get the hell out. Right. And basically. It was so it's like an indicator species that's right. being used. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, which is something they were doing with these people. And the, and the canaries that they were using were an African species. Um, specifically, this convict leasing, it's, it's put in here because <coughs> um, convicts were very often used as scabs. Mm. So, and so there's this really crazy dynamic when, when these folks actually did get together and like organize a union and stuff like this, all these different like various European immigrants, mm. they would bring in oftentimes a lot of black folks yeah. as scabs and really like pit people off against each other and across these like racial lines and stuff. Yeah. Happened in Detroit. In the what years was that when that happened in Detroit? Before oh the crisis? I can't I, I'm not sure. Right, start a ride too. Yeah. But uh, so lots of different divide and conquer tactics. Happen. Yeah. And that kind of thing is going on with the, the immigration, uh, uh, mixed, uh, Latin American people mm -hmm. coming up. Uh, is, is that kind of thing that a lot of people will still say that, you know, they're taking our jobs away and they still really don't have a clue as to what's going on with that. Sounds right. familiar, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, even though we talk about how oppressive the situation was and how many people were in a really rough spot, a lot of the people that we talk to still regard these years as the golden years because even though these people were money poor, they were really rich in a lot of their culture. So, 
it's a little hard to see, but we've got a dance going on. You can see this beetle right here is wearing a baseball uniform because they had baseball teams and, and community events. Here you can see these local foods that they've canned and gotten ready because, like I said, even though they didn't necessarily have tons of money, they had lots of rich foods that they're uh, available to them. And they're celebrating their successes, union successes. Here we have a light, a lightning bug uh, setting up the electricity because in a lot of these towns, they didn't get electricity until the 20s, 30s, 40s. Some uh, One woman we spoke to told us that her grandmother didn't get electricity in her town until the 80s. Mm. And these are the people that are bringing electricity to the rest of the country, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And you can see these flags. I know they're a little hard to see. They're kind of hard to see over here, too. But uh, this has got a medical flag, I mean, a medical cross on it. And this is to represent safety standards, the eight-hour day, the weekend, minimum wage. All of these union victories are things that benefit all Americans today. We have so much that we owe to these miners who put their lives on the line a lot of time to get this stuff set up for us. This one right here is a little clock, eights on it. Is it the eight-hour day? Ooh, this one's hard to see. Um, I'm gonna point it over here. <coughs> here we have a bunch of miners leaving the mine and they're rushing towards the, um, the, the mining town. And this is to represent uh, a lot of the union battles and struggles that happened. This is particular, particularly talking about the Battle of Blair Mountain. Is there anyone who can talk about the Battle of Blair Mountain to me? Acadia? Why, yes. So the Battle of Blair Mountain was the second largest um, insurrection in U.S. history uh, behind the Civil War. 15,000 coal miners gathered in Mingo and Logan County to set up a union by force. A lot of them were World War I vets, so they knew how to use their guns and they had their guns. And they wore red bandanas. Um, some people say this is where the term redneck comes from. And they went in, and then the National Nas National Rangers? U.S. Army Rangers. U.S. Army Rangers were called out against them. And when they saw their brothers in arms, you know, and in uniform, these are old World War vets, right? So when they saw the Rangers in their uniforms, they were like, we can't fight them, you know? We can't fight our brothers in uniform. And so they took off their bandanas, put their guns in trees under logs, and walked away. And so this might seem like a union defeat, right? But people in this area really look back on um, on this battle with a lot of like nostalgia and pride because think about it, 15,000 people got together without Facebook, without the internet. No Twitter. No cell phones. Most of them didn't even have regular phones. And they would get together and, I mean, they hijacked trains to get there. So it's a good representation of the solidarity that was existing at that point. How did they communicate? Wow. Right? Oh. Um, we wish we knew. Yeah, they, know, just, right? they, 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 they still knew how to do that. They had you know? such a well-organized union network. Um, I can't say exactly, right? Letter but, writing part. but it took you know it took weeks for them to all gather, and and there are a lot of other stories. Someone told us this really great story about a uh, um, a huge union victory that was called the Battle of Coal Creek, when several thousand miners got together um, to uh, because the uh, this 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 company had brought in all these scabs to replace these striking workers, and uh, the convict convict scabs and they went and they pushed back the National Guard three times they marched on the jail where the convicts were coming from they literally tore the walls of the jail down and let it and released everyone and then proceeded on to the boss's <laughs> house and we're like okay now pay us what you owe and 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 the, obviously the boss conceded and and folks got what they were asking for which was a living wage and like decent safety standards and we have so much to thank union coal miners for. You know, not only the eight hour day, but the weekend, minimum wage, um, occupational safety standards were originally <coughs> mine workers' safety standards. Um, uh, what am I forgetting? Uh, workers' compensation. Um, you know, all this stuff, uh, these union coal miners were, at, were spearheading all of these really important uh, labor, you know, labor history uh, victories mm. in this country.
So the unions grew ever stronger. They kept winning. They kept using this, using the tactics that won them victories over and over again. And, and no matter what the coal companies tried to do, they couldn't knock them down until the advent of the mechanized, uh, or the advent of mechanization. Suddenly, there were these machines that could do the coal miners' jobs much faster and with much less men. So here we have a drawing of this thing called the continuous mining machine, and it's eating up coal coal workers' lunch pails and hats. <laughs> and here we have these two 70s style activists um, fighting against it. And here in the dead center we have uh, an illustration of what it's like today after the advent of mechanization, what it's like for a miner at these mountaintop removal sites. And it's one of the most important drawings in the poster. I'm just gonna do it over here because you can barely see that. So here we have a frog and he's, he's doing what we call the dance of hard choices. Now, frogs are an indicator species, like we've referenced before. Frogs show more than other species uh, immediate signs of, of what's going wrong in the ecosystem, which is why we chose to use them. So the miner is detonating the explosive that's blowing up the mountain over here. He's receiving a paycheck in return. He goes home in step two, and his tadpole is pouring black water <coughs> as it's happened. He's got pain in his kidneys from, from the environment that he's living in. And he goes to the doctor and has to pay lots of money for very expensive prescription medication and for buying lots of bottled water for his tadpole. And in step four, the tadpole has grown up and his legs and this, his legs are just cute. And the miner has only a little bit of change left and the, the, the child frog is looking towards the bus stop uh, to leave town. Out of Dodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, out of Dodge. Uh, we've heard that in the past 30 years, three million people have, what, have left West Virginia. There's no more infrastructure in these places a lot of times. There's just no jobs. There's not really any option for these young people to stick around. And like we said, the less people for the coal company, the less people who live there, the less problems it is for the coal company. So just in case it's not clear, um, mountaintop removal is the most extreme form of mechanization of research infrastructure. It used to be one of these underground mines would employ about 200 people. Now a mountaintop removal site employs 10 to 12, and they're extracting the coal at 10 times the rate. So, uh, you know, that's, I mean, that, 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 that ends up being, whatever, uh, less than 5% of the jobs that used to exist, right? And, and miners that do live there get paid very well. So for them to speak out against what's happening, for them to talk out against mountaintop removal, and there's a bunch of people in line, it's a lot of incentive for them not to say anything, because if they speak up, easily they can be told, get out. Yeah, I was going to ask this before, because I watched the video um, online uh, the other day about um, some protesters that went to a, it was an Army Corps of Engineer meeting that was supposed to change the process of rubber stamping the uh, permits, and it was pretty obvious that the coal companies got, you know, um, got co-workers there in this town to come and 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 and, and be against the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and they they I mean they totally packed the place, and they they outside they had protesters who were protesting mountaintop removal. They had them cornered. And it's it's you know it's, it's pitting people and, and I was wondering how you guys you guys went to Appalachia what what the input was if you got input from from coworkers as to uh, um, the problem uh, of of it because that that's their first thing and of course what their bosses tell them is that mm -hmm. if if these people who are who who are against destroying the environment get their way they will lose their jobs right. and and like you said they pay them real good money. Um, so that these people, they do not want their livelihood threatened, even if it means destroying the environment. Right. But just wondering if you had any input from. Well, and, and these, these folks who are working these jobs are in these amazingly difficult like positions because they're, they're being paid. I mean, they, they are destroying the land that they love so that they can continue to pay their rent and their bills so that they can continue to live there. Ha like, 
what a mind fuck is that, huh? <laughs> like, and, and just like you say, the coal companies are telling us the environmentalists are trying to take away your jobs. When, in, if you if you think about it for just a minute, you realize that actually the coal companies already took away most of the jobs. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's just like another example of this, you know, really devious uh, divide and conquer type of stuff. Um, it's very hard for people to to make decisions about that because coal is so powerful there that it's um, people like constantly feel like they have an axe down there. Like it's like it's like lumber lumbering in the northwest <coughs> and, and that kind of thing too because they're they they got the the people there, and they're also mechanizing that, you know, where they just have a machine come up, grab a tree, and, and chop it, so that they're, they're taking away uh, um, lumber, lumbermen, lumberjacks jobs away from them, but those lumberjacks that are left are still wanting to fight for their jobs for these lumber companies, but like you said, they're, they're the, the lumber companies are taking their jobs away, you know. I wanted, to, I wanted to ask another question along those lines, too, because we were just talking about because that was my understanding of the history too, that the labor movement played a large part as far as the unions. That's how Jimmy Hoffa got famous himself. But I wanted to know, did y'all, you know, which uh, well, I, from what I understand what y'all trying to do, were you able to document the history of uh, the co-opting of the union, the union structural power? You know, the power, well, in other words, now uh, union heads, they political, so they tell the uh, employees where to go. You get the money, you be in the union. Now instead of the union working for the, you know, for the workers, yeah, like you were showing the strength before, now the unions have really been co-opted. But does that have a history to right. bring us up to date? Well, we don't actually go real deep into that. But right. one interesting thing about the United Mine Workers of America specifically is right. that um, there are now more truck drivers and more secretaries mm -hmm. in the UMWA than there are coal miners. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which is real interesting um, yeah. uh, way of seeing the change of what used to be one of the strongest unions in this entire <coughs> country yeah. has turned into something just a shadow of itself. Mm -hmm. The way the way that you view your project, the, 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 the mural or how are you calling it again? The graphic. It's graphic. Graphic. Okay. Call it whatever you want. Is we don't know what it's the thing over here. <laughs> it seems like, you know, obviously there's this problem <coughs> of, of language and that, that if this message were articulated in, in the correct way, you know, obviously you would think that you know, whatever the political factions, it goes back to that idea of polarization and invective and polemics and just how it just perpetuates this cycle. And that even now, language, when you hear people talk about, well, we need a portfolio of energy sources. And, you know, that becomes this buzz phrase and, and it gets repeated. And, and, and right now we're having problems with the coal in Lake Erie. We've got a huge mercury problem, but it's very difficult to articulate and then, the, of course, then, then they'll talk also about we got two nuclear plants, we've got Davis Bessie and we've got en Enrico Fermi. Um, and so it, any kind of alternative or any kind of um, a deeper understanding just gets immediately swamped by this invective, this dynamics, this... I mean, it just seems like this is a very skillful way, perhaps, to try to articulate. And just in the way you did, I, I'm really impressed with what you did in that little town in Maine. And that, that there'd be this way to get the message out there to kind of saturate like even in a place like Kentucky and realize that no this is not a Fox News kind of forum or CNN there's really some issues here that you need to slow down and look at and, and it's not you know left versus right I mean I'm really impressed with what y'all are doing and and this this mechanism this way to get through the language you awesome. know? so for for a lot of us in the collective the like our inspiration for doing this work is so this, you know, this, uh, this strategy, in a war strategy where you don't attack your enemy right straight on, you come at him from the side, Amen. right? That's just, just like basics, right? So for us, like being able to come at things visually and on these, all these, and metaphorically and all these, all these other levels that we, like our bones know to how to tell stories and how to un appreciate and understand oral history and hearsay and this super legitimizes a very old way of talking about stories Absolutely. and so in that way it's very infectious and takes on a life of its own and 
it can talk about what the right answer is in a way that's not about what's correct or what one person thinks or some arrogant like activist who's coming at you and telling you blah 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 through some speech or a radio program or a book that's all about hitting people over the head with words. We're like using this other strategy to get people by their hearts and get people, trick them by um, pay, being able to pay attention to cartoons and stories. Um, and so in that way, we're like trying to hone that, that strategy and, um, and figure out how this can, can function. And so for real, like what you're talking about is it's, that feels, that's why a bunch of us are addicted to doing this is because it feels really good to be able to go talk to a whole bunch of people or know that these posters are functioning out there in the world in a way that we're telling people the truth we're telling people really hard shit that none of us want to think about it and we're doing it in a way that as best people are saying is inspiring and it's like sugar coating the truth in a way that people want to digest it and want to be able to sit with it and 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 connect their heart to it where a lot of the mediums that we've been using as activists for a while they're just so heavy-handed it really turns people off and so that's that's where we're at with it right um, so up here at the top of chapter three we have a sequence that shows where the coal is going um, and over here on the left we have this big power plant that looks like a train engine uh, pulling in a train uh, of factories and reaching out with all of these arms, one of which is connected to the continuous miner machine here. Others are sucking up water and gobbling up the land. Um, so in the United States, now a lot of people, even some of the bees, thought that uh, that coal disappeared with the steam engine, that it was obsolete. But today, 50% of our electricity comes from coal. Coal is used to make most steel, and it's also used in the manufacture of concrete. So let's think about this. Um, when we consider the infrastructure of our industrial economy, where do we see electricity, steel, and concrete? Ah, everywhere. everywhere! It's everything, right? It's all of all of our all of our um, manufacturing systems, all of our transportation systems, even a lot of the places where we live and work and play are built up out of all of this stuff. So, and even if you even if you live in an area where, when you flip the light switch on, you're not consuming coal, the vast majority of uh, manufacturing is done with coal. Does anyone? Is, does anyone know any um, any stats about the amount of coal, the percentage of coal here in Ohio? Folks in Indiana told us it was 96 percent. I bet in Ohio, it's similar. Uh, I would I would think. Um, so coal cranes go through Toledo every day. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Two. Yeah. We were here a few minutes ago. Sixty percent. Sixty percent. Okay. Yeah. Um, Did you? 60% of what? Of the electricity. Oh, yeah. Is, is, is cool. So, can we go to the next one? So, yeah. but even if, e even for those folks who don't, whose light switches aren't hooked up to coal power plants, all these goods are manufactured using coal because coal is abundant and cheap and very powerful. So it's perfect for mass uh, mass manufacturing. That's why China is using up so much coal and exactly. making all our crap. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, a lot of, um, uh, at, at least at least some of the stuff that's mined in, uh, in the southern Appalachian coal fields is going to China um, because it's too dirty for in the United States, uh, according to our standards. And so where is all this, where is all this stuff on all these conveyor belts going to? It's going to this um, temple of conspicuous consumption. You see down here at the bottom layer of this pyramid, there are all these this McMansion Country Club neighborhood. On the second level, there are all these SUVs. And on the top, let me point to it here so you can see it better. On the top, there's this shopping center um, where all these goods are coming into. Now, one, one thing you might notice about this is that there are a few details. Uh, like, these, these houses have solar panels on them. <coughs> these SUVs are uh, hybrid, electric-powered SUVs. And this mall is lit up with compact fluorescent light bulbs and has a big 
green leaf bandage, like band-aid over the top. Because they all mean well, right? They all mean very well, right? Um, <laughs> does anybody have any thoughts about why we wanted to uh, put that little slant on it? You could be fooled in what you're looking at, like the plug-in car is really a coal burner. Absolutely, exactly, right? Absolutely. Um, because folks like Al Gore are telling us that all we need to do to fix this this problem is replace X number of light bulbs with compact fluorescents and all of a sudden everything's going to be fine, right? Um, and we have to, it's really important for us to, to think about where our, our intentions to, um, our, our very good intentions of reducing our carbon footprint reducing our impact, becoming more sustainable, where those can be used well and where we're getting scammed. Because when we, um, when we buy these new energy efficient, you know, energy star appliances to save on our electricity bills, where do last year's products go? Out the poop chute, down here, into the dump, right? Tell the Prius story. I'm good. Awesome. Um, one story that I really like to tell is about I read in a magazine article recently that, say, person A um, buys a brand new Prius to save on gas. Person B buys an old clunker that gets terrible gas mileage and replaces little bits and pieces until the thing just totally goes kaput and runs down to nothing. Then they buy another one and another one and another one for the rest of their life. Um, the amount of fuel used by person B throughout their entire lifetime is not even close to the energy and resources that get put into building a brand new Prius. Right? We have to we have to really take into account all of the factors, all of the costs that are going into these um, into these choices that we're making. Um, yeah. I was going to say, has anybody seen that cool cartoon called The Story of Stuff? There, there's this really awesome um, little animated cartoon. It takes about 20 minutes to watch. It's called The Story of Stuff. You can watch it on the internet, and it super breaks it down in this really memorable way, talking about the life cycle and the manufacturing of all our crap, and how us just um, going at things on a consumer level doesn't address like all the level of um, resource intensity to manufacturing and things like that. So anyway, I really recommend people watch this because it's it's very memorable and it's all in cartoons too. So essentially you see through this sequence that we're gobbling up, eating up resources, converting them into products that we can buy, and then as they become obsolete, we're spitting them out and wasting them. And they're just going, you know, into this ever ever growing pile of useless crap that may or may not be decomposing in landfills. Um, and you know, there's, you, there's always, uh, we're, we, uh, <coughs> I lost track of what I was saying. <laughs> so, also, there are a few other details on the power plant to help us understand that it goes beyond just the consumer economy as well. Notice that these transformers look like missiles. The the uh, the smokestacks look like Gatling guns. There's a big American <coughs> Eagle symbol on the power uh, the power line towers. And this is to remind us that um, enormous amounts of of energy and resources go into just maintaining the industrial infrastructure, into just maintaining the American Empire. Um, you know, uh, coal is the fuel of the American empire. And in fact, the U.S. Defense Department is the number one worldwide, number one consumer of fossil fuels, number one emitter of carbon dioxide. And in general, there's this whole, there's just this whole, um, uh, somebody, you know what I'm trying to say, I just can't think of my the war economy is dependent on concrete and steel and going to other places and taking people's shit, killing them, blowing up, breaking stuff, and then getting people to giving people contracts, giving corporations contracts to go then use more concrete and steel to, to break all of those I things again or build them back up, whatever. You get it. Like, awesome. And 
Boris, a huge consumer of coal, right. is what we're trying to right. get across. Thank you. And and we were talking about this concept of like um, obsolescence, you know, planned obsolescence when all these products get, you know, get thrown out. Your computer get, your, or your iPod is is like useless within two years or something like that. Well, things like bombs and weapons are like the ultimate planned obsolescence. They're made to be destroyed, right? And and so that you can continually make more and more and more. And now we're in this place where we're kind of, it's like we're going to war with the mountains themselves, you know, three million pounds of explosives a day in West Virginia, just destroying these things and reducing them to rubble. And over the top of all of this, being fed by the smoke coming out of these smokestacks is this huge hurricane swooping in over the picture. Um, this is to remind us that coal is the most carbon uh, carbon intensive fossil fuel uh, and um, we've been burning it for a couple hundred years now and um, and excuse me uh, the the NASA climate scientist James Hansen recently went on record to say that if we stopped burning coal worldwide that's 80 percent of the solution to climate change right there um, something something to think about, right? This, um, this thing, it's, it's interesting, a lot of, I, I just want to, I don't usually say this, but I want to make a note, a lot of times people are, uh, we, we do presentations with audiences that are a little bit hostile, um, this is very different, um, but folks don't like to hear us say that there's a, that, that um, there's a problem with our consumer society, that there's a problem with the way that we're eating things up so much faster than they could ever be replaced. And, and we've definitely had folks react really harshly and say that, but, but coal built everything that is America, right? One, one person said, you hate America, don't you? You're anti-American! Yeah. Um, and that's true. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, I mean, the fact that it built, the fact that All it of built these things are true. It's true. <laughs> um, but... You love America? But... <laughs> But, uh, but but at the same time, it's um yeah. it's killing us. What you know what what the hell are we doing building a society that's totally self-destructive uh, and it's like inevitably gonna wipe ourselves out? What well, uh, we have a debate raging right now in this community of Bayshore, which you, <laughs> if you came down to the river, you would actually be able to probably much see. There's a huge coal plant there and. Uh, there's there's a big expansion in the works, and, and some local folks have uh, expressed concerns, but I think, again, it's back to language in that if there were some kind of way that your presentation could sneak in there and, and like, that, that more folks could become aware of it, you know, it, it could completely transform the, dis the debate. But right now, it, it's just, there is no complexity, I think, in, in the opposition. It's just simply, it's going to be, well, we don't want the pollution or something. A few folks, and, and they're going to be quickly, you know, squelched by the corporation. And all the issues of mercury, because those, those, what Doug said about the two coal trains, they're going to Bayshore and they're going to the Whiting plant, which is in Luna Pier. They're both right along the lake and dumping the mercury in the lake. But... Again, I, I just wish, I don't know how long you'll be in town, but it just seems like there, there needs to be this more skillful way. Because if, again, if activists go down there, and these are just regular folks out in a small town. They don't, they don't you know, there's already gonna be this polarization, but if you could be <laughs> subtle and go in there and get that message out, it could, it could completely transform the discussion about the Bayshore expansion. Well, let's talk about that type of stuff more after. Okay. okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks yeah. for that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, we're going to take another step back in history to get a little more context. Um, here at the top of chapter two, we talk about the Industrial Revolution. We show the Virginia State House, which is built on a foundation of lumber, cotton, and coal, connected with this in, uh, uh, steam-powered textile mill. This was one of the industries that built up the economy in the 13 colonies. Um, and. I don't even remember what I usually say about this. Let's go to the <laughs> um, And up above it, we have this weird little thing. What's this? Wagon train with a missile on A wagon train with a missile, yeah. <laughs> it's a what do you think this represents? Like the concept? 
expansion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. The um, colonization of space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, NASA's you know, first space program was called the Pioneer Program, right? So, um, and we we want to use this to kind um, of to kind of poke at, poke our finger at this idea that progress in our society is synonymous with manifest destiny. This idea that progress means going where we want, taking what we want, making whatever we want out of it, and um, <coughs> usually not really considering the consequences of these actions. And um, a perfect example of that type of mindset is, is, um, is the colonization of the Americas in general. And over here we show a few sort of generic scenes of that. What's this? Anybody want to call this up? What does this look like? Can you see it? I that, see people squinting. That's a duck mean, like a superhero. Maybe you can't see it. So, <laughs> um, this, is, this is displacement. And here we show um, theft of the youth, taking them off to the settlement schools. And here we show colonizers bringing smallpox blankets, early forms of biological mm -hmm. warfare. And we also talk in here about specific examples of how colonization played out in southern Appalachia. And so here we show the Trail of Tears. In, in 1838, mm -hmm. when Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, and tens of thousands of indigenous folks, mostly Cherokees, oh, were forced wow. on, like, on a f they were sent on a forced march um, through the winter to Indian Territory, which is Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Uh, thousands and thousands of people died from cold and hunger <coughs> and disease. And, um, and memories of this still linger in this area. So I just want to I just want to point out that there are these there are certain themes that could continue through this graphic. We see here with the Trail of Tears that there's this history of displacement. And over here with the bus stop we see that displacement continues today in different forms. And we see over here with the, with the coal camp that there's a there's a history of extraction in this area. And we see with this drag line here that extraction is happening uh, today as well in a very different form. Also, here with the <coughs> union organizing scene, we see that there's a rich history of resistance in this region. And as we move into chapter four, we see all the different ways that people are resisting today. So this which is right here, for those of you who are in the back, is referencing the Highlander Center, and more than that, it's talking about community education. You see animals from land, water, and air gathering together. These are all species that are endangered in the area. Um, the people who will be most, or the species that will be most affected, and they're coming together to talk about the issues and brainstorm ways that they can react. And here we have a bunch of people getting ready for a protest. Can you guys see that over there? It's right down there. Do you, what, what activities do you see here? Do any of these look familiar to some of you? Sign making. Yep. Sign making. There's a petition being signed. Um, people are lighting candles for a vigil. And they're educating each other with little charts. And just above them, you see these outsider activists parachuting in with their various privilege and abilities. Um, you know, there's a little grad cap here. <laughs> this rabbit also has a U-la. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a laptop and a camera. Maybe they're going to do some indie media documentary. Um, and the most important part of this scene is that below them, there's another outsider activist, a rabbit, with these air traffic controller wands telling them where to land. And this character knows where they should land because it's listening to a native butterfly, to one of the elders, the community elders, so that they <coughs> land in the right space without disrespecting all the work that has been put into it. We heard a lot of stories of, you know, yeah, outside, outsider activists are great, they're coming in here, they're, they're doing things like water testing because they were able to go to school, blah, blah, blah. And then we also heard stories of, well, these activists came in and did this awesome action, locked down or whatever, but then they left and the cops came to my house. So it's really important that 
if you're going to be an outsider activist that you pay attention to the community you're going into. Here's some city animals. We've got a cockroach and a poodle and a squirrel and they're doing lockdowns to stop this new coal truck. And here we see these paper airplanes flying through the scene uh, from this paper renter, Millipede, who's going through all the permits and the legislation, backing them up by turning this in, turning these into paper airplane hearing request, hearing requests, which are gumming up the gears of the coal factory to buy these activists time to build community support. And this, the coal machine <coughs> was coming in on a wave of money that's coming out of the ATM slash Wall Street financiers. This slide is talking about, you know, you can't really fight the coal companies directly because a lot of the time they'll dissolve, after they're done with a the site, they'll dissolve the company, sell all the shares, fire all the workers, then they'll reform under a new name with no history. So how do you fight that in a court, right? So what people are fighting are the financiers, the banks, um, the legislators, this is Capitol Building printing out all these permits, and of course the revolving door <laughs> between the two of them. And in the middle we have walking flailing inflatable arm tube men, defined by Aaron. So <laughs> like, you know at the used car lots with woo, right, the big tube men. Um, and you know they got the fans under them, they're full of hot air. And these represent um, the big green organizations and they're all bending over backwards to stamp the permits. Do you want to tell the story? Sure. So, um, so we, um, <coughs> we talk about not only the, the, the banks that are funding mountaintop removal and the regulators who uh, <coughs> have created legislation that has giant loopholes that make things like things like mountaintop removal legal and permitted, but also these these big green organizations that are um, essentially uh, greenwashing, right? Um, making this uh, making this facade, d uh, distracting folks, um, and the r the the big sort of wishy-washy middle of the road greens are especially people in um, in southern Appalachia are especially suspicious of them because in the 70s when there was a very strong movement to abolish all strip mining it was growing really rapidly um, both in numbers and in, in in volume and in intensity Jimmy Carter said he was fully in support of it um, and at, at the last minute, this, this coalition that included the Sierra Club, Natural Resource Defense Council, and a couple of other smaller groups stepped in and said, we'll negotiate this for you. We have all these hotshot lawyers who can get this all figured out. We can get some legislation passed for you. Um, folks agreed, and, excuse me, and, um, and, they, and they went in and started working on some backroom deals that you can see here. Uh, and when the legislation came out, Folks celebrated. It was called SMACRA, Surface Mining Control and Regulation. Uh, uh, Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act, excuse me. Um, and, and then they realized, wait a minute, this didn't abolish strip mining at all. It set up a, uh, the Office of Surface Mining, this government agency, that these companies had to apply for a permit to be allowed to do things like mountaintop removal. It didn't, you know, it just it just put one very small step in there. Um, and so, in general, folks are constantly fighting this battle against um, not only these, you know, these two entities that are profiting very directly off of, um, off of uh, the money that's made through mountaintop removal, but these, these big greens are also um, scamming folks as well. Uh, you did good. Thank you. I'm telling you something. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe come back, come back, come back. Go back. <laughs> so, we almost never get to bring this up, but I really like it, and I think you guys will get it. There's 
um, you know, little dotted lines over the sky and they're cutting out and tearing down pieces of the sky. Does anybody know what that might be a reference to? Say it. Uh, yeah. Those, like, uh, uh, permit, permits for, like, how much carbon, like, you can emit and, like, the trading of that and how that sort of um, affected like a lot of other things, but I mean, it's basically like, you know, you, you have this much sky, and if you want to trade some of your sky to somebody else, you can, and you know, that way, you can all make money off trading sky to each other. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. We've already figured out ways to own water, we've figured out ways to own land, and now we're figuring out ways to own our, our very air. So, <laughs> this is what we like to call the showroom of false solutions. <laughs> Um, would anybody like to name some of these false solutions we have featured up here? Can you see them? They're over there too, Ethanol. behind. Ethanol. Ethanol. <coughs> Nuclear. Solar. Solar. Wind. Wind. Clean coal. coal. <laughs> it's bubbly, look right? at it. It's so That's clean. The science fiction of clean coal. We also got hydrodams. And liquid natural gas. Yeah. Exactly. That's corn exactly. Up here. Does anybody recognize corn, the, the tree in the top right? Palm oil. Palm oil. Palm oil. I heard somebody ding, out there ding. saying it. That's awesome. So, you know, about this point in the presentation, most people, people, somebody, somebody will get up in the audience and be all in a huff and say, okay, 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 we won't use any more coal. What are we going to replace it with? And the thing is, as Aaron was saying before, that hunk of coal, that's millions of years of sunlight energy. We get one year of sunlight into our planet every year. So if we're burning a millions of years in one year, the, the math doesn't work out there. So could we ever possibly replace coal with any of these means, with solar panels? One year, right? Uh, the sun also affects the wind, which turns the turbines. If we covered the whole earth in corn, we wouldn't even come close. We wouldn't even get a fraction of the amount of energy from that ethanol as we do from coal. Hydrodams, they block up the rivers and affect wildlife up and downstream. <coughs> Liquid natural gas, I mean, they're thinking about drilling it in my area. I'm, I'm not gonna be able to drink my water anymore. Uh, nuclear, like, <laughs> We're the viable, mineable uranium in this country is only going to last us another 60 years. So we're just going to launch ourselves into another energy crisis. Um, am I forgetting? Well, I just want to mention how much space that we will have to cover with solar panels <coughs> if we're going to use that. Because it is, you know, in theory, this really clean, renewable resource. And, you know, when using it on a local level, it's such a great idea. But how much land are we going to have to cover? It's been said that maybe we could cover the entire desert with solar panels and we could power America, but then what's going to happen to the desert? Or we'll be continuing to create these sacrifice zones. And there's been maybe, five, maybe not, someone in a previous presentation may or may not have referenced covering other countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah when, we're, when we're living in the, the <laughs> cult of the good idea and who are the, who are the dudes that get to come up with these fabulous ideas to get the promotion, you know, they're going to want to coat the whole continent of Africa with solar panels so that the people in Europe can, whatever, have their I mean, plug-in toothbrushes. Like, this, it's, it's really, <laughs> um, yeah, there is, there, there is no easy answer, and that's, like, we're, we're stuck, and that's the point we're at, and it's, it's really scary with us trying to talk to people about this, because we, we all want an answer, right? Like, it really sucks to be alive right now and inflamed in the guilt and, like, just confusion about how to be responsible in this moment. And it's it's not it's not about having an answer. It's about having lots of questions and talking to each other and trying to get to the truth of the situation and working on our imagination and our creative problem solving so we can get to the point where we can understand these other ways of thinking that get us around the problem in a different way besides just trying to buy our way out of it, right? And I don't know if you want to say this at the end as well, but I don't know if you mentioned like the solar, like the concept of photovoltaic glass. This is actually the glass, or well, used to be the glass capital of all, but that's one of the areas that UT, University of Toledo's research, and it's a friend of mine, 
on that project where every every pane of transparent glass on earth would be a photovoltaic panel. It, so it's not panels the way we thought of them in the past, but I didn't know if you included that as part of the solar mix. So, so you're saying, well, also that, okay, we could be upset about what the corporation is doing, but wait a minute, let's think about it. Okay, now, but what are we gonna do? So we can argue against some, but in the meantime, what are we creating when we argue against one specific thing? So the whole argument is the argument in, where's the solution that we find the argument? It seems like we might have to go back to the farm and then make the car. Get the horse and buggy back out there. Well, maybe we maybe we're being presented with a false problem, right? Like right. That maybe the mindset that's there behind just us, like humans, being able to meet their basic needs and respect the planet and each other, like it, replacing things and either. trying to keep up <laughs> with ourselves and the way that we're doing this. It's just it's it's fucked, right? And we can't think about it that way. So. I, you know. This is such a problem because I can give you uh, a microcosm example to show you what, the, what exactly, like, it could be a lot more people. I mean, the presentation, I just learned about y'all the other day. I was looking at this drawing that was already here. And the guy was telling me, I thought it was fantastic. And he was telling me y'all was coming today. And they was explaining the drawing to me. Y'all did a good job. They explained it pretty good. But I was in prison for something I didn't do, of course. I didn't do it, y'all. Of course, we know. But I was in there, and um, they had the situation with the phone system where if you're a prisoner, you call home, they put a surcharge on you. I forgot what it was. It might have been like six dollars, <coughs> but every minute they charge you a lot of money. So, yeah, right, and they got this place called Cure Ohio that's advocating for inmates, trying to help inmates out. You know, trying to show inmates just like y'all doing with this presentation, but showing sure up how to fight how to be active in your own, you know, in your incarceration where you can get something positive out of it and, and, you, and you can stand up for yourself again because the corporations have taken over the prison system in so many ways. Through prison labor, private corporations, prisons, you know, um, or just the people that work in the criminal justice system is using bodies as a ways to a means mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, the, in their endeavors, in their careers. So, um, you know, even the police and stuff, but the different, um, when we talk about weapons and technology, put the police department in there. It ain't just the defense department. They always coming up with new weapons and new ways to keep people under control, infrared, scopes, or whatever. But, so Kira was, um, was telling inmates, well, y'all don't use the phone, ain't no harm, for one day. So you can take away this bunch of money from the prison system. Because actually the phones, the prisons get some money and the phone company gets some money. So they charge you ridiculous rates to prisoners' family, mostly <coughs> poor people. But the prisoners, the people who suffer the most, were so, you know, because I was reading about it, other people read, was reading about it, so I tell everybody. But I think the people in the prison were so self-absorbed. They not even paying the bills. You know, people getting their phones turned off because you calling home. You you can't take the time to get a letter in the envelope or write a letter. You got to go talk on the phone. One of the stamp, I was the price of a stamp about thirty some cent then, and you rather pay, you know, hundreds of dollars. Some dudes getting other people just to talk on the phone. Well, they wasn't willing to give up that prison, that privilege for one day. That's the same thing with this society. Ain't nobody gonna be a lot of people. You know, because, like y'all get this presentation, but because of um, um, the corporate America or, or the corporations, I won't even say corporate America. I say all of them around the world, because they all got a hand in it now. Mm -hmm. if, if you think about rich people, how they out there. But, you know, they don't pay a billion dollars or a million dollars to have an advertisement at the Super Bowl, because I watch sports. Because they know people gonna watch. And then tomorrow, when the commercial play, that's what they're gonna be talking about on TV. And those people that spend all that money that had that commercial on TV, they're gonna be talking about it on the TV show. When people go to work, they're gonna be talking about it. that product gonna get sold. Because people watch TV, people watch MTV. Well, that people, actually, I'm sorry. You know, go ahead. No, that, you right. That, that yeah. talks a lot about there's, there's one thing that I would love to talk to you 
about lots of things that we can do. Um, a little bit more of the presentation. There's something called, um, there's, I can't remember the phrase, but there's like, turn off your television day, there's buy nothing day, there's right. a lot of things like that. There's a lot of things that we can participate in, and I'd love to tell you more about it. I'm really glad you came. It's right. nice that we, we I just hate people don't get involved. They're more interested. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're and actually you know, going to, we're going to, I hear what you're saying with people need to like look at the bigger picture and right. who they're all affecting with their decisions. Yeah. So when we're talking about how we're going to uh, have our energy system working, like when we're talking about revamping our energy system, we got to think about if we want to talk about social <coughs> justice, if we want to talk about ecological justice, then we have to come up with some way of meeting our energy needs without screwing anybody over or having sacrifice zones on the earth. Right? So, one last thing. I just want to throw out an, one little reality check connected to what our friend is saying here. Just like an acknowledgement, right? That it is a miracle and a privilege that anyone can keep their eyes open to the problems and, and find the time and the energy to be trying to do anything about it, right? When we all got the boot on our face in different ways and it's really hard to keep yourself awake and and upbeat, not depressed, and it's like really hard to figure out what to do. And like, even though we're not coming here saying there's any answers, like trying to fucking stay awake and stay inspired is a huge thing, right? And so, anyway, I just want to acknowledge well, what you're saying. I think that's very important. I think a lot of what y'all bring deals with that. Right. But I think, though, how do we get over that? Because I think. You know, the hollywoodization of our minds is like, you go deal. to the store, they got, what's the magazine? It's like you watch a TV. What's the magazine? Uh, oh, all of them. The gossip magazine. All of them. And they appear to you. You walk by. You know, I don't even, you look at uh, President Obama gay or something. Like that. You know, I mean, they, what, you, what they talking about? You might open it up. You know, but a lot of people, if they're not conscious or thinking, you know, this is what this this is what's gonna be their agenda. It's not gonna be like okay, the people from the Beehive coming down here tonight. You know, people in the city need to be knowing. You know, you need to. I mean, it's beautiful that you're here, but like, you should be in the library, and it should be crowded. We go to the library. Yeah, I mean, like, it's a, but like they have a, a tribute to um, I think what's his name? Not John Coltrane. What's the guy from Toledo? Art Taylor. Yeah, yeah they, they had the library full. I was looking at the picture, right? Which <laughs> he deserved it, but I mean, this deserves yeah. well, this deserves that same kind of uh, yeah. You know, well, we're on our way. We get we get big audiences sometimes, but the point is that we give people these posters, and people like you and all you guys in this room take it and you tell the stories, and that's the first step to beginning to solve these problems because humans are incredibly clever, and we made this problem. We have all the faculties. To to, to solve it. We just have to talk to each other. And about yeah. it. Awesome. Yeah. But just keeping in mind, too, that the people who often look like they don't care, can't care. Like, we, a lot of us fucking can't care for all different reasons. And, and the process of decolonizing your mind is one of the most important things. Like, that's the like, take-home message from this, from this talk. Um, I just kind of wanted to bring up, you know, this, this picture about alternative energy has been set up here for a while, so I kind of want to bring up the point um, that, you know, even, even really, you know, like, clean uh, energies, you know, like uh, solar panels or wind turbines or stuff, isn't sustainable at all, and a lot of those, uh, you know, alternative energies require, you know, an industrial uh, infrastructure to, to work, you know, let's say, well, coal mining is really bad, so let's use solar panels. Like, well, I mean, you still need the mining infrastructure to get, you know, magnesium for the solar panels and things like yeah, that. And exactly. there, none of them are, are real alternatives because none of them are sustainable. Awesome. I mean, I just want to bring that up. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Right, and there's lots of people who are saying that, uh, and I agree with with some of these solutions. Is is that you have to destroy the system that that keeps the power in place that wants to. Um, you know, that, that, that keeps the, the, uh, the uh, economy and keeps the uh, the using of uh, resources, ex extracting resources alive. You know that you have to bring down capitalism. That you have to you have to bring down the system. And and there are uh, a lot of us who who try to get a little bit involved in in monkey wrenching the the system to to keep from going as it as it does. Uh, whether or not that's the ultimate solution, I you know I don't know, but. I know that we we kept definitely can't keep going the way we're going, or 
you know, we're going to lose our, as Derek Jensen calls it, the, our land base, you know. Um. That's a great segue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of solutions out there, you know? There's a thousand solutions out there. And a lot of them are already being practiced, right? And the inspiration, if we're going to think critically about how to fit into this world, then we got to look at our history, right? So we go back to chapter one, and there's this scene of a beaver dam. And beavers, when they move into an area, like they might seem really destructive at first, knocking down all these trees, but the dams they build actually provide habitat for fish and for heron, and they collect silt and sediment from washing down the stream. So when they move on to another area, that all that silt and sediment is left behind, and it's this beautiful, rich soil that all these plants just burst up in, right? And the idea of stewardship, <coughs> leaving a place richer than you found it. There's also a snail up here harvesting corn, beans, and squash, the three sisters, because when you plant those three together, they're, they're mutually beneficial, and it doesn't deplete the soil like monocropping, right? So at this point, you guys are like, oh, come on. Wait, you're gonna you're gonna tell us to go live in the woods and like be naked and make things out of sticks and just be primitivists, right? That's not what's happening here. We're talking about being inspired by things, by other mindsets, and taking taking instruction from those things and 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 looking at them and understanding how we fit into like our world right now. Exactly. So so downstream we also see a mud puppy collecting clean water. Um, a crayfish harvesting ramps, some chestnuts up there, you know, harvesting local foods, understanding your area, adapting your life to your area instead of drastically changing your location to fit your life. I mean, why, why are we shipping apples all the way from Chile when we can grow them in our backyard? Sure. So, we also have this scene uh, with a group of critters gathered around a fire, telling stories. Uh, they're being called to council to, uh, to share with each other. Also note that chapter one takes place under a night sky. There's a really specific reason why we chose to do this. Uh, when the bees went to visit Bill Kaler, who's the head of um, a lobby group called Friends of Coal, <coughs> they asked him, why do you believe that mountaintop removal is necessary? And he said, well, I'll tell you, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been in a power outage? Have you ever been in the dark? It's scary. <laughs> coal keeps the lights on. We need that coal. That's, that's it. Uh, we just need it. And, and, uh, and, and the bees that went to talk to him about that were kind of taken aback and didn't really know how to answer that kind of argument because, boy, what do you, what do you say <laughs> to that type of mindset? Now, it's, it's interesting because there are a lot of very good reasons why we have this instinctual fear of the dark. Uh, but at the same time, um, what, you know, we're, um, is, it really, is it really appropriate for us, for us to try to like totally obliterate it by filling our world with 24-hour Waffle Houses and sodium lights on every highway and parking lot and street corner and flickering TV screens in you know all over the place. Um, what are we losing by losing the nighttime? Half, full half of our lifetime. We're losing the opportunity to sit around a fire and share stories. We're losing the opportunity to sleep peacefully and to dream. To see the stars. To see the stars. And what what effect is that having on us as a society? We're, we're losing um, hormonal balance. <laughs> and there was a study in Italy uh, looking at uh, prepubescent uh, uh, youth. And they took away uh, artificial light, uh, primarily uh, television, video games, and um, 
television, video games. What's the other big one? There's obviously another big one. Television, video games, well, and computers. Internet. internet, yes. And, and they found that their melatonin levels went up dramatically within a couple of days, and that one of the explanations for the um, huge outbreak of early onset puberty is all of the artificial light that we absorb. And Whoa. some people may not believe it, but people used to live in the dark right. every yeah. once in a while. Mm -hmm. like, right. And then we got afraid of the dark and we created this marvelous infrastructure. To tag on to that, um, they've done studies with children like eyesight. If you leave like night lights on with your children, um, most of them end up with glasses when they're older. And there's not to defend the uh, glasses wearers, but like these things are, you're supposed to have dark. You're supposed to have these things for eyesight, for melatonin and sleep and for also, life. You know? We kind of forget we're animals, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you guys noticed, there's this crazy thing. I grew up in Orlando that has lots of light, so I didn't know until recently, but if you sit around in the dark for a good 20 minutes, you can suddenly see in it. Mm -hmm. It's called this thing called night vision. I don't know if you heard of it. <laughs> Apparently we all have it. It's crazy. <coughs> and so, another, <laughs> another really yeah, important, <laughs> another really important theme that's in, in chapter one, we see this scene with these squirrels digging in the soil, burying nuts. You know, squirrels are like the great planters of the forest. They only, <coughs> they only recover a fraction of the nuts that they bury. Yeah, um, and <laughs> a local naturalist tells us that the smart squirrels take a little nibble out of the acorn and uh, kind of mess with the embryo, so they're not the great planters of the forest. But well, I think squirrels deserve credit. <laughs> and <laughs> go on. I'm sorry. Wait, I asked you. <laughs> 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 Here they're burying these nuts, and mixed in the soil are the, the mycelia, the roots of these mushrooms, busily breaking down all the dead matter in the soil into the essential uh, nutrients and, and minerals that these seeds need to grow into new trees. This is to remind us of the cycles of life and death, and the fact that in, in the natural order of things, <coughs> nothing is ever wasted. Every, you know, uh, and it's like the second law of thermodynamics. One of the most important things in the whole idea of physics is that energy and matter are <coughs> created or destroyed. And in a healthy ecosystem, every single piece is always reused for the, for, to, to, build, to build new. And it's really interesting, I think, that we have this society where we're taught that we're, uh, we're living through this historical trajectory, this linear path from point A to point B. Uh, some people I know will say that point A was paradise and peace and abundance and point B <coughs> is some sort of fiery apocalypse. Other people will say that point A was savagery and brutality and, and, and filth and misery and point B is some sort of techno-utopia. If we can just build the right machines, we'll be in Star Trek or something. Um, but either way, no matter how hard we try to push that linear historical view of the world um, on, on this world that we live in, the earth continues to rotate around the sun. And every <coughs> season goes spring, summer, autumn, winter, on and on again. Night follows day over and over again. And every generation uh, succeeds the previous one. So, uh to emphasize this idea of cycles and change, you know, recognizing the change <coughs> through time, but recognizing the cycles as well. As we move forward into chapter five, we have this scene of seven salamander women, definitely taking inspiration from the Iroquois idea of making your decisions based on how they will affect the next seven generations, right? So we have an expectant salamander mother learning from her great-grandmother how to use the how to use the medicinal herbs that are native to their area. Um, we have a young adolescent salamander learning from her grandmother how to plant cattails to ensure they will always have a, a healthy environment to live in. We have a mother bathing her infant in the water, appropriate water use, right? And then we have a metapausal salamander here weaving a tapestry, her artwork, their culture, which is connecting all of them. And I just want to I just want to add that everything we have in chapter 5 is taking inspiration from projects that are already happening, you know? Like this isn't some dreamland. 
these are things people are really working on. So right here we have an uh, example of bioremediation. Does anybody know what bioremediation is? Mike, is tell us what million? bioremediation is. Come on, Mike. Well, I mean, it's using uh, plant species, and, and you can also use uh, mycelium uh, to pull toxins out of the environment and either hyperaccumulate them or to change their molecular composition so that they're no longer toxic, the concentrations. Yeah. Just like the plants that make coal. <laughs> Just like the plants that make coal, exactly. It's, it's taking advantage of uh, the natural processes that already exist in these uh, plants in order to clean up our environment. And here we have appropriate waste management. That's what I like to call it. Um, these worms are composting. How many of you compost? Yay! Um, it's really easy for those of you that don't and just learn from your friends. And here we have some grubs using old tires and a bucket off of, um, off of a front loader as a planter. Maybe this is an urban garden. <coughs> and here we have water collection, rainwater collection. And this is really important that we included it in here because in a lot of these areas where the aquifers have <coughs> been, you know, toxified, in the human concept of time, they're going to be ruined forever. You know, no one's going to be drinking that water for a very long time. So we really need to go back and learn these ancient practices of collecting rainwater. Right? And here we have, can anybody see what's going on here? Okay. Um, it's canning, but it's taking place in a community kitchen. These, these are springing up a lot. It's, um, it's a commercial grade kitchen that small farmers and local businesses can use, can have access to in order to process their food or to store their food for the winter. And it's also a place that people can learn how to cook or teach each other how to store their food. There's one in Wood County, which is about 20 miles from here, and people can rent it for about 25 bucks an hour. It's a nonprofit. Cool. Really? Also dealing with the idea of food sovereignty and local food economy, we have a bee bringing a CSA box into the into the city. Uh, does anyone know what CSA stands for? Community Supported Agriculture. Yeah, Community Supported Agriculture. It's where people buy shares by giving the farmer, paying up front uh, the farmer, so the farmer can buy the seeds, etc. And then as the harvest comes in throughout the season, they'll get a box of food every week. And this really cuts out the market fluctuation. So even if it's a bad year, that farmer will be able to survive until the next season. And a lot of this poster is really celebrating the rural, right? Appalachia is a, is a very rural area. But we don't want to tell you all that you have to go out to farms and, you know, and live out in the country in order to be sustainable. There's a lot of sustainability projects happening in the city. So our version of high density living um, is this wasp nest, a paper wasp nest. So they're running a print cooperative, paper print. And, um, and they're, becoming, they're working on being sustainable in the city through things like urban gardening, they got solar panels, they have uh, they're insulating their house so that it's more, their nest so that it's more um, efficient. They're hanging up their laundry and they're washing their dishes, a very important part of all cooperative. <laughs> Wash your dishes, y'all. <laughs> I mean, the very washing area, it says no revolution will happen until the dishes are done. Agreed completely. So it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then we also asked a lot of people in the area what would have to happen in order for you to feel that things were getting better? And the most common answer was, well, if, you know, we were talking about youth flight. If our youth, if all the people who have left felt like they could come back and started to come back, we would know that things are getting better. So here we have, like, this idea of return, you know? Somebody's coming back, there's a big welcome home banner. And maybe somebody had a big job in the city, they're bringing home a piggy bank. Um, one of them went to school and learned how to do dentistry and eye care. And the queer birds are coming back to a culture that finally accepts them. Mohawks, look at their mohawks. <laughs> <laughs> and the boa. Oh, yes, and the boa. 
Um, and then while we were talking about the Trail of Tears, um, we were, uh, the bees were lucky enough that while they were on their research trip, they were able to see part of the longest walk, which, uh, happened in 98 and... 78. 78 and 2008. Eight. Eight's everywhere. And, um, and it was, it was a massive march of indigenous folks from the West Coast all the way to DC demanding recognition of the treaties and talking about indigenous land rights. So, you know, here they're <coughs> tearing down the fences and coming back to the land that was once theirs. And here we have a couple of birds tearing down the fence, uh, tearing down the dividing line between company land and turning it back, bringing it back to the commons. And we also have birds tearing down these power lines uh, not because we're against all electricity, but because when you transport electricity over long distances in this fashion, you lose a great majority of it due just to heat loss because these wires aren't very well insulated. So instead, they're erecting windmills to generate local power to serve their local need. And this is a smaller scale uh, energy production. Um, we've seen the plans for this. It's all recycled parts. So this is a squirrel cage. It's a water turbine, by the way. And it's small enough that it doesn't disrupt the flow of the stream or any of the organisms living in the stream. And this is a squirrel cage fan out of an air conditioner, a car alternator, and this is a box full of batteries that are being charged. And you could use <coughs> something like this to power a low frequent or a low energy radio station. Maybe this crayfish is gonna charge his bubble maker in his aquarium. <laughs> no. So when we when we go through this graphic and